if I don't piss half of you off, I'm not pushing it hard enough. My objective is to always try to push the boundary a little bit, challenge assumptions, and have you scratch your head a little bit. As we know, education is really messed up. This can't work. All students are different, and to batch them all together is really stupid. And yet that's what we do. Brain science knows that we're all different. What do we do about it? This clearly is the model. Maybe it's not thousands, but it's definitely 30s and 50s. And it's, it's a batch process that comes right out of the industrial age. Then we know this. This is the attention span of a typical kid. Uh, this was done by uh, some guys at, the, at New York University. And if you'll notice, 20 minutes in, you're down to 25% engagement. That means that everything that's above the line is a total waste of time. The teacher is wasting their time. The kids are wasting their time. So this is not the solution. And you know, teacher in a box isn't the way to do it. What we really want to be able to do is change the paradigm. We have another big problem. Yeah. Have you ever seen this before? Homes are always a good investment, easy loans to the masses, no moral hazard in the decisions, because the government guaranteed it. Now we have college degrees always making more money, easy loans to kids, which used to be illegal until you were 21, no moral hazard decisions. What that's done is allowed a very sloppy, inefficient, terrible, higher education industry to exploit kids at a time when they have not developed the reasoning to make long-term decisions about their life. And the result, in the housing market, we're kind of experiencing that. Kind of? Indentured servitude. And that's real, guys. Turns out, that 40% of college graduates in 2008, before the recession, only 40% were engaged in occupations that used their degree. If you take out the hard sciences and teaching, it's down to 17%. So all the rest of the kids had an 80% chance of wasting the fifty dollars to $100,000 of student loans that they put in. The net result, this is what we call an indenture. You used to could, for a better life, go into indenture, they'd lend you the money, and you had to basically be a, a slave for seven years. This is another one. This was outlawed 200 years ago for adults. And now we've got 18, 19, 20-year-olds that are getting into debt that is unsustainable. And we really, I, I believe it's toxic and wrong. And they're talking right now about upping the interest rate to 6%. So 6% of $100,000 is all of a sudden a double house payment. That's wrong. The premise is wrong also. Everyone should not should not go to college. Some should, but a lot of people shouldn't. And a lot of the dropout that we have in our high schools today are really because the kids have self-diagnosed and said, since this school is all about getting me in college and I'm not going to college, this is a waste of my time. Here's the real question. Everyone should get the job skills that they want or that society wants? I'm not going to answer that here, but until we answer that question properly, we're not going to be able to fix our school system. It also needs to be as cheaply delivered as possible. That means we've got to get the inefficiency out. And that means a total redesign. Computers do not help 
industries until they redesigned their workflow. Schools have resisted it, and now they need to. Another big shift. Before credentials were important, a degree, an authorization, an MBA, what have you, it's moving slowly to experience, and it's going to end up at merit. And merit is the ultimate arbiter. At Atari, we hired for, for enthusiasm. The 2600 that you guys have all played was designed by a high school dropout. Okay? Now, he trained himself. He was really good. He was very creative. Wonderful guy. The other big change is subjective versus objective. Right now, most of the grades that everybody gets tend to be more subjective. The computer can make this very objective and efficient. We're pro approaching a singularity and a perfect storm. And the perfect storm is this education landscape will explode in the next five years in some very surprising ways. And these are the ways I think it goes. We know that all students are unique, and so we're going to have a massive amount of, of individualized instruction. We, we put them together in a lecture. Yeah, go next. That slides out a little. Learning is best is when a student's active. Sit still and be quiet. That's pretty stupid. Go ahead. And what we really want to do, and you're going to hear a lot about this in the future, is thalamic engagement. Thalamus is the thing that sits on top of your brain stem, and it, it governs everything that you, every activity that you do. It turns out that when you engage your thalamus and you're active, you learn better, you learn faster, and you remember it longer. Sitting and looking at a lecture, even reading, watching a movie, watching a, a, um, a, uh, um, a video, it's all passive. And, and Khan Academy may be a great lecture, but it's not active, unless you call pushing the pause button active. <laughs> now, brain science is going to rule. And the brain science is very clear. Active, movement, spaced repetition, adaptive. All those things work. They work really, really well. Let me make some predictions. All high school students will have work skills. If you really want a good job right now, just learn 3DFX and go down and work for Pixar or, um, or uh, you know, DreamWorks. Turns out that they are constantly looking for graphic artists and a high school student that spends six months learning those skills can get a job, 80000 a year. Our, our, none of the high schools I know of are teaching this. Why? How many, how many English classes are teaching science fiction? No, they want to prepare our life, our students for life in the 18th century England. You know? <laughs> We're going to be continuously learning throughout our lives. K through gray is absolutely real, and it's going to be cheap and powerful and effective. All students will learn at their own pace. That's what our software is going to do, and your software is going to do, and everybody's software is going to do it, or you'll be dead. And then the part that I love, creativity will flourish, because that's where all the good ideas. Creativity is about inventing the future. That's what I want to do. Here's the one that's going to piss you off. By 2018, there will be zero dollars, this is a public school, for textbooks. Zero. There will be zero dollars for learning software. Now, I've probably torpedoed an awful lot of business models right there. But I think that the schools will be willing to pay for results. Very different. Understand that there is difference 
between teaching and learning. And if you're not focusing on learning and results, you're toast. Labor will be much more efficient because, oh, all of the extra money that is going into textbooks and everything will go for hardware. And don't forget hardware maintenance. Believe it or not, iPhone and iPad screens break. And all of that is going to be paid for by somebody. Why are teachers going to become massively more efficient? Because teachers are best at explaining things that are confusing. And if all the heavy lifting is done by software, the teacher being there right at the time when the student is confused, it's really good. And that's really good because another thing, right now teachers spend between 20 and 30 percent of their time on discipline. That's boring for students, it's boring for teachers. Get rid of it. No forum. You know, if you're a, if you're a screw up and you want to be funny, be disruptive. I'm a prime example. I was really, never mind, I won't go there. Um, paperwork and grading. Ask yourself this. If students can shop for a teacher, what do they shop for if the teacher isn't grading them? Bingo. They will be seeking the best explainer they can. Teachers advise on projects and project-based things, building stuff, doing research, having fun like that. That is really good stuff. And that's what our kids need to do because tool use is actually neurogenic. You build your brain. Projects cause creative problem cells. They, they build your brain. And they're rewarding, and they, they create passion. And that's really what we want. If we can have our kids maintain the passion that they had the first day they came to school, we train that passion out of them. That's wrong. And of course, Socratic discussion is really fun. But there's no Socratic discussion in a room of 35 kids. Maybe eight, maybe 10, but no more than that. And by having a lot of the kids doing screen time, we can afford it. We also need to have appropriate exercise. Turns out that most of the problems of ADHD and, and other issues of mood and depression could be removed by having aggressive exercise. There's also this thing called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. If you exercise aggressively for 20 minutes at the beginning of the day, everything you learn will be put into a little bit of hardware in your brain. Massively powerful. You integrate it with learning, and you start, the, start lifelong active patterns. This is today. Notice all the lecture time, which is the stupidest use of students' and teachers' time ever. This is Time and hours in 20, 2018. Notice how much screen time. Notice how much project time. Notice how much lecture time. A very, very different model than we have right now. So you've got to build your model into figuring out where you're going to be playing. This is a little bit more detailed. I actually put in 2015. This is how it'll go. Notice how much time one-to-one -one happens in 2018. Some people believe it may go up to a half an hour. This is going to depend a little bit on, on budgets, because that's clearly going to be a lot of where the teachers spend their time. OK. <coughs> Let me, excuse me. Let me talk a little bit about resistance change. This is basically a differential equation. And what you really want to be able to do is if you resist change too much and have too fast a fall time, you will always have overshoot. That's destructive. That's where things break up and blow. Let me talk about the education market. I'm running out of time. <laughs> Am I it's going good? Okay. 5% of the world's GDP in general 
is focused on education. No matter how poor the country, they tend to spend 5% of GDP. That's over a trillion dollars in the U.S. alone. The current system is massively inefficient. We are getting so little for that trillion dollars, it's remarkable. And, and the thing about it is help is on the way, and you guys are doing it. Um, the change is res very restrictive, and we have the perfect storm. It's a combination of the hardware being available and cheap, networks being available and cheap, the cloud being there and available. It's really, really good stuff. And somebody is calling me, but... <coughs> okay. Next one. I'm sure you know this company. It's free. And you get to build a farm. Um, but you have to buy a cow. Wikipedia. It's free. And it costs zero to create content. This is the pent-up demand for supplemental education. And you can always calculate these things because if you have something that costs zero and a certain number of people spend fifteen to fifty thousand dollars to opt out of public education, you can fill in that triangle, estimate the number of people that are in that never never land, and you can calculate it and it comes out to be six hundred million dollars. Or six hundred billion dollars. That's a lot of money. I'm I'm disappointed on that. It's, it's, it's $600 billion plus. Anyway, um, next slide. The education market, talked about it. Next slide. This is our school. This is the way it's going. Next slide. We changed the learning process. Lecture homework, lecture homework, test on Friday is the typical metric. That's a big waste. We turn it all into play. And play is much more effective because you're totally active. We have a response every seven seconds. And what is the net result? It is highly, highly effective. We are currently uh, teaching in front of 50,000 kids. Next slide. Um, and they're learning three to five times faster. And it's getting faster every day. Funny thing about it. The faster you can teach kids, the more fun they think it is. Even though the games look like crap. Now, why is that? Well, it's because they're engaged. And I, I would recommend that you all look at Makai Chichimihai's TED Talk on Flow. It's what we've been doing in video games all the time. It turns out that if you're in the state of Flow, you learn faster, you're the happiest you can ever be, and it's a matter of tailoring difficulty and ease and put it right in the middle so that you can just barely make it to the next level in the game. The Brain Rush platform, we're doing all kinds of things in terms of, of various items. Our, our alpha test has been in Spanish language, and we, we have kids now that are, have learned Spanish vocabulary 10 times faster than their peers. You know, and now we'd like to do a little bit of a, of a demo to show you what it is. And what it is, it's really about spaced repetition. This is where, anybody know where Suriname is? Well, you will now. Uh, <laughs> and essentially, what you do, go ahead. So can we flip over to me here? So I'm just going to give a quick demo of Brain Rush and some of the ideas behind it. So what we're building is an online community uh, of supplemental lessons. So supplemental lessons meaning that they're a perfect supplement, complementary to all the existing curriculum as well as what teachers are doing. The idea here is that every lesson is a mini game that takes the typical student 10 or 15 minutes of play to master, um, and that the games can be across a lot of different platforms. What I'd like to do is just show you one game and tell you a few things about some of the unique features of the way these games are designed. 
So here's a game for students to learn the names of the countries in South America. Um, in this case, w when they first get in, they can kind of just roll over and see the names of the countries. Brazil. Click and hear how the country is. But the real power is in learning. You learn through play. And the way you learn through play is you just click play. No, you don't really need instructions. You immediately get in, and you're immediately being required to guess which one of these is correct. You've got a very short period of time to respond. You respond. You start guessing. Every now and then, you guess right. Paraguay. As you start doing it, you're very, very quickly learning the names of the words because your brain is engaged in the process. What happens is, as you get better, the game will get harder and harder. You'll get more choices. You'll start, um, you know, it'll start going a little bit faster. And within a few minutes, I won't play too much. Within a few minutes, you'll have, you will know the location and name of every country in South America and play. A very, very rapid process. When you finish that first stage, I'm not going to demo the second stage. You will go to a second stage where you actually have to type the name of every country. It'll highlight a country. It'll force you to type the name. Within about 10 or 15 minutes of play, the average student will know the location, the name, and the proper spelling of every country in South America. This is the interesting thing. When they finish playing, they know it, guaranteed, because we've combined presentation, practice, and test into a single step play. So I know, we know, not just what the students did. We know what the students know. When they're done playing, they know it right now, but they're going to forget it real soon. What we do is we build in automatic spaced repetition so that for those lessons the student wants to build permanent knowledge or that the teacher wants them to do that, the students have the option to do the reviews when the tool tells them to do it. As long as you do the reviews when the tool says so, then you're building long-term memory very rapidly and very efficiently. It turn, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with spaced repetition, but the bottom line with it is that if you space out the reviews exactly right, you can do a lot fewer reviews in order to build a more or less permanent understanding of that information. Now, this is an example of four different lessons that we put up as samples. What's interesting about these four lessons is that it's the same game engine with different content. And one of the features that we're looking to add is the ability for teachers to add their own content to our game engine and the combination of those two creates a new lesson. Wikipedia. So what we in effect do is democratize the building of content so that these very efficient, high speed, simple games become almost, uh, cost almost nothing to build and our community can build them. The other thing that we're doing is allowing teachers to customize the lessons that are assigned to the classes of students and monitor how the students are doing. So this is our platform um, that we're creating. And this is, world, this is worldwide. Remember that all the different subjects across the bottom axis, the difficulty from preschool to PhD and above on the vertical axis, language and culture on the z-axis. And it turns out that once you fill in all the blocks in that three space, we have a worldwide repository of knowledge, and we know what you know, when you learned it, how much spaced repetition, what the decay rate of your brain is, and we get a map of exactly what you know. We never present, then, things that you don't have the precursor information. So here's the big dream. Everybody learning all the time. Spaced repetition couple of hours a month, you will remember everything you learned in high school and college. Pretty and remarkable. You might actually be a better human being. So 2018, near zero cost. Everybody is learning all the time, really effectively, very fun, anytime, anywhere, cell phones, iPads, what have you. This is high velocity learning. We really believe that we can get it maybe 20 times faster. Think about that. 20 times faster. That's, a, that's, that's more than an order of magnitude. That is big change. Fast is fun. And so this isn't drudgery anymore. Great value for time spent. 7 billion students. Where do you say 7 billion students? That's the whole population. Bingo. I believe that the whole population of the world can, can, can be accessing this over time with remarkable results. Think of what happens if everybody is more educated than they are now. 
I believe that the world immediately jumps 5% in world GDP. Better life for everybody, less war, less famine, less pestilence, you know, and then we'll all have a party. The golden age of capability is just around the corner, and we're going to create it. Awesome. So. Well, um, let's have a seat and discuss all this. And Tyler, maybe you can run a microphone for me. I'm sure some teachers will have some ideas and thoughts. Um, so I guess the first question everybody's going to have is, OK, this is great for memorization of you know, uh, uh, countries and capitals and presidents. But the criticism, of course, will be, well, how do you teach something complex? How do you teach themes of you know, Shakespearean plays and, and things that take the higher learning? Well, it turns out that much like software, we believe that we can building block up to a pretty high level to things that you would think is just rote memory, but is actually higher cognition. Example. However, yeah. Well, um, that would take too long to explain, because, yeah. and I don't even want to go there. Um, what I want to be able to do is, first step, just get the teacher out of the way for all the stuff that she hates, or he hates. They hate. They hate, yeah, I, I'm still old fashioned. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and by doing that, we make, I mean, the, the teachers that are using our, our vocabulary tool, they love it, because now they can spend all their time, they actually speak Spanish from the day the kids jump into the class now, which they couldn't before, they're talking about grammar and syntax and all the stuff that they love to engage the kids with. And that's good enough. Right. And we believe, I mean, you know, think about biology. Not, you know, that's all space, spaced repetition, things like that. But then we have designs for set engines where the relationship between objects are important. We have a sequence engine where the order of things are important. These are getting very close to the higher cognitive values. Then we have a Boolean engine. Now, Boolean is a fancy word for learning rules, and learning rules that help cognition. You can learn those, and once you do that, all of a sudden you can operate those rules on data sets and information. And you're getting damn close there. But, you know, hey. But even if you just get this first third or half done, that leaves the teacher for all that one-on-one -on -one time, exercise, and projects. Right. So you said um, that one of the things that struck me was uh, no money for textbooks, no money for software, pay for performance. Does that mean uh, pay the software vendor or the service provider, the SaaS provider, software as a service provider, only when the child uh, or student has memorized all the capitals in the United States of every state? Yeah. And then they pay you a dollar per student. Remember. I believe that there are trends that are happening that are inescapable. And the trend is pay for value. Don't pay for, a t for, for trying. Don't pay for anything else. And so if a, a software vendor isn't willing to embrace the model, pay for results, you will not get any business. So just start to remodel your, your thinking about efficacy. If you're not effective, I don't care how pretty your thing is. If it's not effective, you will fail. Now, you can, it's the old story. You can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool all the people some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. And, and what's happening right now is reality is setting into the education world. And so you've got to find out what the reality is. And the reality is kids aren't learning enough for the money they're getting, that's being spent. And until that, and, and that is going to get fixed so fast, it'll make your head spin. Uh, what are your thoughts on actually paying students for completing the material? We see this great inefficiency. You talked about the software provider, the service provider, only getting paid for results. What about the students getting paid for results? Controversial topic. If you were president of the universe, is that something President Nolan would do? Everybody gets a dollar. I like God for, better, but that's yeah, just me. God, uh, president of the universe, God king. Um, um, there is so much controversy on all that. And what I really believe is it comes back to all kids are different. Hmm. And if you're giving a dollar 
for an hour of homework to a kid from Beverly Hills whose, whose mother is Madonna, not yeah. very effective. Right. But if you give credits towards getting a new pair of Nikes to a, a, uh, a son of a single mother in Compton, you probably get a whole different thing. And I do know this, that if you get a lot of tickets to kids when they're eating pizza, they love the hell out of it. <laughs> yes, that's been, that's been proven by Chuck E. Cheese. So thoughts from the audience, and we have a lot of teachers here. I would be interested to hear questions, um, and then maybe even some of the kids in, who are here in the audience, what they thought of learning um, via um, the game and going fast. So feedback from our audience, teachers or kids. Wow, I think people are all taking that in. I generally scare the hell out of a lot of yeah. people. Just a quick question. How do you identify which kids should go to college and which kids shouldn't? It's not for me to, it's not for me to decide. The real, the real issue for me is to have the kids decide what would be a cool thing to do. Earn $80,000 a year right now working uh, for DreamWorks or should I finish high school? You know. That's going to be the kind of questions that we want to have kids be able to ask. Germany, right now, graduates 20% of the college graduates that the United States does. But they have a really, really cool <laughs> apprentice program. For example, if you want to do something using a master machinist in the United States, there's nobody home. You can't get a, a, an injection molded tool built here. You can't do complex machinery, you have to outsource it. That's wrong, because those are good manual skills that require a lot of training and a lot of import, and the nation needs them. But they're not being taught because somebody's learning paleontology so that they can be a cab driver. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, question for the audience, yeah. Um, how do you keep the, your games were very simple. How do you keep interest in it? I mean, the mechanics are, really, really simple. You're just clicking the button. And I've noticed when I do games like that, I just click buttons and I don't actually learn anything. And maybe it's in the second stage where you actually have to type something. You'll, you won't be able to do that with ours. Trust me, this, this thing is, it's all, it's all done by the wizard behind the curtain. And I'm never going to let you see the wizard. But it works. And it works really, really well. And we believe that you know, I mean, you go to Wikipedia when you want to look something up. You'll go to Brain Rush when you want to learn something. And it will be the most effective thing that you can do. And it will actually stick it in your brain whether you want it or not. And, uh, and just play with our stuff. And if you, if you can honestly tell me that you can dick around with it and not learn Spanish vocabulary, you're wrong. We can, we'll find you out and we'll hunt you down. <laughs> another question from the oh another question back there okay and then we'll take one here and then one back there okay so a uh, question up here first yeah, and who right. are you what do you do uh my name is mario and i'm a founder of a startup okay uh, speak a little more yeah hi my name is mario and i'm a founder of a startup um i think it's a great uh, thing you're building we we're actually talking at lunch about how something like this is needed um one thing i was wondering and it sort of um came from uh, marshall tuck's talk yesterday about making sure that the tools we build um, serve everybody and include, for example, students in special education. So um, particularly those students who are most at risk. So how could your tool, or have you been thinking about how you make your tool accessible to students with visual impairments or physical disabilities who already struggle with the, the current technology, so the new ones that we're building really need to be thought at the onset of being usable? And autism and ADHD right. and all this stuff. Oh, that, yeah. autism, ADHD, love our shit. But um, <laughs> our stuff. There are kids here. Our wonderful, we have kids in pristine, the pristine, wonderful thing. I'm sorry Sugar. about that. Um, I train my children to appreciate profanity, but that's another thing. <laughs> uh, it turns Use out it judiciously. It turns out that we have, um, we we think that we are very good at the one sigma kids. We're also good at the two and the three sigma kids when it comes to learning and learning disabilities. 
because spaced repetition is effective across the board. And so we think we're, we're really good there. When it comes to things um, like, like physical handicaps and things like that, we think we can adapt to it. Uh, we, have a, we had an email from a, or was it a call, a call from the car, kindergarten teacher? Why don't you tell that story? Kindergarten teacher about typing? Oh, we have a part with the typing, and the kindergarten teacher said, you know, is there, is there a way you can turn off the typing? Because my kindergarten kids are having trouble with it. And so, yeah, we can adapt it because, you know, kindergarten kids, bad muscle coordination, that sort of thing. They don't know And it wasn't intended yet. for kindergarten kids. It I was not it. intended yeah. for it. Let's but take it, another it question. It shows here. the ad yeah. adaptation. Hey, uh, my name is Elise Musa. I'm the founder of a technology startup called B. It's a technology platform that enables students to learn and then earn money to help pay for college and earn other academically relevant rewards via a quiz application. My question to you is, have you considered doing a pay for value for students so they can help to tackle the $25,000 average student loan debt, which is about a trillion dollars right now in this country? Um, yeah, and, and I, I actually like the idea with some kids to be able to reward them. And there's a lot of companies that are willing to, to put money into the till. And, and whether it's, it's for college or whether it's for a new pair of Nikes or whether it's for a, an iPad or, or a trip to Chuck E. Cheese, um, yeah. um, we're going to be doing a lot of testing on that. And the, one of the things that we really like, since we know when you know it, we can do all kinds of stuff, like for example, how, what time of day was it when you learned this? Did you learn, do you learn faster in the morning or in the afternoon? Do you learn faster if you have a high protein breakfast? Do you learn better if you've exercised aggressively? We think we can answer more questions about education in the next five years than all of education research before has happened. And once we have all these things filled in, we can tune you like a, like a Stratus file in and you'll be learning and happy. Let's take a final question in the back. Yep. Hi, my name is Ritu Jaina, founder of Learning Jar. Uh, we are a platform to help people track all the disparate ongoing learning that they're going through yep. and prove that they've built certain skill sets and get a job with it. Uh, so we completely resonate with all your messages today, especially the bold message that by 2018, education will be happening in a different way. Uh, my question to you is more around the whole badges concept that's come up in the past couple of years. Um, you said that people are moving away from credentials and moving more towards merit, and I couldn't agree with you more. But there, yeah. there is a faction of society that's, ta that's taking credentials and making them into more badges, certifications to badges. And I wondered what your thought was around that. Badges, badges. yeah, badges. There's, there's an issue that I believe in, which is, that a lot of times badges and recognition are doing the wrong things. They are motivating the motivated and demotivating the unmotivated. Uh, in our system, we actually believe in stealth scholarship, that everyone should compete against themselves, not against others. Now, to the extent that the badges are your private domain and you know, Zynga does a great job of filling up histograms, um, and we will be doing a bunch of that, and maybe we start giving you badges, but they're not going to be available to brag about, because I think that we need to get this idea of competition um, out of the schools a little bit, and let everyone be their personal best, because that's really the, the final an analysis of what we want to do, is we want to maximize the capability of the individual. And some kids are going to take a little bit longer. Some kids are going to take a little bit shorter. I don't care. You know, all I want them to do is really be good at something that they get passionate about. And that will give them a happy life and hopefully a great job. On that note, let's thank Nolan for joining us. Everybody check out Brain Rush.